Hey everybody, Josh KI6NAZ. I just got finished doing a talk with the Crescenta Valley Radio Club, um, kind of outside the Los Angeles area. And we're, the topic of the day was portable antennas. So I'm bringing you that talk right now. I hope you enjoy it. Consider giving me a thumbs up. Thank you. Without further ado, we'll introduce Josh Nass. He's KI6NAZ. Um, he's living in SoCal with his wife and two sons. He's an engineer and an avid ham now. He's been a ham since 2007. Um, his recent interests are soda and QRP and digital. And um, he's uh, the YouTube sensation these days, hot <laughs> nazi. So uh, please welcome Josh to do the presentation for tonight, Antennas in the Field. Thank you, Josh. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Allie. And uh, big thanks to Jim N0XXX for inviting me out here. I appreciate you doing the coordination. So behind me, if you can see my, my picture behind me here, that's the top of uh, Palomar, sorry, Pacifico Mountain, which is uh, the west side of the Angeles Forest. And what's so great about this is it's so close to all of us here that there's actually a campsite right on the summit. So if you're interested in soda and you like to get out camping, it's both a, a drive up camping location and you can hike there. And it's really nice, kind of primitive camping, but you know, it's pretty good to go in that sense. So I just wanted to share that before we get into it. So we're gonna be talking about portable antennas, portable antennas in the field. Uh, my favorite use case kind of getting out with radio is to, you know, kind of wherever I'm at with the kit that I'm carrying, be able to deploy an antenna of some kind and, and see what I can what I can do with it. And we're going to talk about some different ones, what I recommend and, and kind of what I tend to stay away from. We covered a lot of this already, but yeah, I was born and raised in Whittier, California, lived there for most of my life and then moved to Cerritos. Uh, I was exposed to amateur radio in the 90s, kind of like a lot of people do through Boy Scouts. But it was ultimately my first Elmer, Richard Crum, KE4, G, and K that uh, we met at Boeing when we were working on a, a satellite ground terminal together. He kind of got me started again, and I, and I learned about soda, summits on the air. And that kind of really lit the fire for me to go from technician to general. And that's kind of what led to these antenna building projects and, and fun stuff that I do. So anyway, and now I'm a, I'm a systems and software engineer by trade. So as mentioned, the Ham Radio Crash Course started in about 2017, but I've been on YouTube since 2006, just making kind of fun videos that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But in about 2014, I noticed that my amateur radio videos were probably my most popular. They definitely had the most engagement from people commenting, wanting to know more information or, you know, just curious about different things. And so that's kind of where I just put the focus of my entire channel recently, which has been absolutely fantastic we we do a live stream show kind of like this actually kind of how you're seeing me right now uh where we do slides we take questions we do demonstrations in fact i, I do things like uh an overhead shot of stuff i'm working on like portable antennas uh, but you know it's a lot of fun and anybody if you're curious the name hosh nasi started before i was on youtube it's a it's actually my name josh nass it, it was something that came out of college it's just a way of saying my name in a weird funny way so that's how that's what i use it for okay so portable antennas i say choose a path here because there's there's really a couple of roads you can go down with portable antennas when you're deploying them and then the field and uh they're basically Two different paths in my mind are backpackable, like summits on the air, something that you could carry on your person, not really weigh you down too much, still be effective, but you know, be something that's probably more along the lines of a QRP radio setup, something that's going to be 20 watts or lower, but QRP is most common at about 5 to 10 watts. Uh, that picture was taken and Bertha Peak and that's in Big Bear, California. That's an 8,400 feet summit. Really, really nice. Uh, remember, Big Bear's already 6,400 feet above sea level, so you're not actually hiking a, a whole ton to get to the top there, but it's a, it's a pretty, good, pretty good hike, a lot of fun. So backpackable antennas, packable antennas are easy to carry with you. They fold down. They often will rely on, like, a long wire or some kind of a gimmick of some kind to get it up in the air 
but effectively, like I mentioned, they're, they're QRP. Then the second kind of group of what I would call portable antennas are, are luggables, something that lives in a bag or something that you would put in the trunk of your car, something that is a bit heavier to carry or just kind of bulky. And generally, I, I see them as being kind of freestanding. They have a mast of their own generally. They often can handle at least 100 watts of power, if not going all the way up to legal limit. And many of them, a lot of really cool ones I've seen, use a, a big metal plate that you drive your car over the top of, and the wheel of your car kind of holds it still, and you, and you put your vertical off the top of that. Luggables are kind of like something you would deploy for field day, or if you were doing like a de-expedition, if you were thinking about something like that. You guys were just, I'm also planning what I'm going to do for field day. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I guess I'm going to do this in my backyard under emergency power. I will likely be using a luggable antenna, as I would call it. Okay, so let's talk packable antennas first. So the antenna that you see there is an Elecraft AX1 antenna that stock covers 15 meters, 17 meters, and 20 meters. It's kind of designed to use the tuner in the Elecraft KX3 and KX2s. It's pretty, it packs down very small, about the size of the KX2 itself. And it's, I'll talk about a little bit more um, on these as we go along, but they work, but again, extremely portable usually comes with some cons. So primarily packable antennas go into a backpack for a hike uh, to get to your intended deployment area, and then you, you go ahead and set them up. Generally with me, it's in my go bag or my day-to-day -day bag. It's just something that kind of lives with the QRP radio that I'm generally carrying, which again is an Elecraft KX2, along with maybe a Raspberry Pi and my laptop to interface between the two. They're usually lightweight because they don't handle a lot of power they pack down pretty easily, and they usually have like a telescopic mast, at least some of them. The other ones, though, are generally like monoband uh, wire antennas, if you're thinking about like a dipole or something along those lines. Pretty good monoband, just simple antennas. They're all usually assemblable, or, or you can erect them in a field pretty easily. There's nothing better than throwing a line over a tree and then kind of hoisting an, an antenna wire up into the, into the tree. And the big point here, though, is, is homebrew is generally very cheap. You should absolutely, if you're ever thinking about getting into portable antennas, consider making your own. Consider looking up plans and, and pursuing the homebrew options because there's a lot of great antennas, extremely cheap, and they work really well. Case in point. Oh, wait, no, we got to do the cons first. Then I'll have my example. Sorry about that. <laughs> so there's cons, of course, to these packable antennas in uh, cases where you're not using, like, the full length of your wire for whatever band or whatever frequency you're operating on. Generally, they're kind of compromised. The example of the Elecraft uh, AX1 is a vertical telescoping vertical but obviously that's not a 14 foot vertical but it still does 20 meters well they do that by including those loading coils and i, I believe you can see it uh, that copper wire there that's on the left let's see if you can i can show that um, that copper wire is the coil that allows it to get to work on the other bands that it supports. So there's a compromise with that. It'll change your radiating power a little bit. It will affect where your antenna matches and how wide your bandwidth can be when you're using it. Again, the, this antenna, the AX1 that I mentioned, is specifically designed to work with the KX2, and it has a pretty robust uh, 10 to 1 tuner in it, so it can handle the mismatches, which aren't that bad to begin with, without much issue. The other example, though, that's in that picture next to the KX2 is an antenna that's been around for a really long time. That's the MFJ 1899T, and in fact, I, I have it right here. Um, I can hold it up. Let me hold it up. So this is the antenna that has these coils. It's a coil of wire with these taps, and you use a little plug to basically short where you want the, the band to be or where you want the antenna to have extra wire on. In case in point, this big section right here, that's all for 80 meters, right? So you can consider this is really only a five foot telescoping piece, and there's the rest of your antenna all bundled up in this in this little loom that's shrink uh, coated or shrink heat, shrink wrapped. 
So that can affect the uh, antenna output for sure. So keep that in mind. They're effective though in that they're easy to cart, cart around. They're easy to put in a pack. They're effective because you can they almost weigh nothing and you can kind of set them up really, really easily. The verticals often will deploy only one single radial uh, or counterpoise, if you want to call it that. And that can also have an effect. If anybody has a vertical antenna at home for HF, you likely have a couple of radials, at least four or more. And that's going to give you a much better performance out of that vertical. Well, with these portable verticals with the telescoping mass, there's really only one radial. And while it's not very directional, you can generally kind of line the wire up in the direction that you want to make contact. So if, um, like I am, Southern California, like all of you, you kind of put that radial pointed out towards the east and, and hope for the best because, uh, again, it's a compromised antenna. And then there's another set which we'll talk about which generally use some kind of matching transformer. And those would be an example of like an end-fed half wave, a really long wire antenna. We call it end-fed because the actual coax mount for your feed point is right at the little junction box that's on the end of that long wire. And then you have the random wire antennas which use a 9 to 1 un un as well. And there's some issues with that that um, we'll talk about. But the issue that I find that I've experienced when out in the field is with those uh, matching transformer based antennas, end fed half wave, particularly the 9 to 1 un uns with the random wires, is you get stray RF back into your radio. And that's usually via the feed line, which the RFI is getting picked up on the shield and coming back down into your radio. Not a big deal if you are on QRP, for instance, but if you start bumping that up to 100 watts and you're running a computer nearby or you're doing digital, maybe you're doing FT8 or JSA call, um, that can have an effect on your station. So that's kind of a con with those. All right, so what's a good antenna to build? I mentioned homebrew earlier. If you're starting out, a, a speaker wire doublet is a fantastic antenna to build, to kind of get an idea of, of how doing some homebrew stuff works. And, and it really gives you a good idea of how to tune an antenna like that. Uh, it's pretty simple. You just get speaker wire. You're going to kind of split it to the appropriate links. I'll have another slide that kind of gives you the, the mathematical equation on that. But they're really easy to build for a specific band. In the case of this picture that I have, I'm using what's called a Japanese fly fishing rod that's referred to as Tenkata. And it is a telescoping mast, usually made of fiberglass or carbon fiber. And we just attach the middle center connector of the antenna and hoist that up into the air. And when you do that, with your tuning it, you basically attach your antenna analyzer to it and kind of fold over the legs of the antenna until you find where the SWR is lowest for the frequency that you want to operate on. This particular antenna that I'm working on is for 20 meters. Generally, that's the band I use when I do soda, and so I was kind of cutting it for that length. Being again that we're in Southern California, we have a wonderful environment for summits on the air, not just for the activators, but for the chasers. Uh, chasing a soda activation is a lot of fun. You basically are helping out that person that's activating the mountaintop by giving them contact so that they can activate it, and they need four generally to activate. So if you've ever heard of KG6HQD or W6RIP, who both make YouTube videos kind of documenting their soda activations, they're likely using a simple speaker wire dipole, so they can be incredibly effective. I've seen Jerry, KG6HQD, on what's referred to as a one-point soda summit, which is the lowest one you can be, really, really small, more of a foothill than a summit. And he worked Kansas on uh, a couple of microwatts on single sideband. And it was absolutely, I was shocked in what he was able to do with it. So, you know, it, it a lot of times, I will say this up front with portable antennas, particularly with QRP, it can be frustrating, but when you give yourself a little bit of elevation, um, go to a nice quiet area, you can, you can generally make some contacts with it. If you're lucky, if there's a good station that can pick you up and, and work with that. The only piece of kit you need with this antenna is a BNC breakout post or a BNC connector for your radio and then the two red and black leads. I'll have a picture of that a little bit later. 
and the antenna mass, which I already mentioned, would probably need some guying unless you have some other alternative means. I have often just used the uh, little metal wraps to wrap it to a picnic table, and that's all I've done. I just take my little fishing pole, you know, send up the send up the pole, and just kind of wrap around a couple of times to the side of the picnic table, and that seems to work really well. This article came from QST, and it's talking specifically about zip cord antennas and feed lines for portable applications. I used to have the what issue that was. I'll have to look it up, and then I'll, I'll reply to Jim, and he can pass it around. Because you likely have this issue. I believe it was at the end of 2019 where they talk about it. But again, it's incredibly easy antenna to build. I highly recommend it if you're interested in having an antenna on you, um, you keep in your bag, particularly if you if you keep an HF radio along with the ride or wherever you're going. And how to build it's really easy. It's just uh, 468 divided by the frequency that you want to operate on, and then divide that by two. And that length, that number you get, is what each leg of that doublet should be. Make sure you leave enough of a feed line there at the bottom that you see in that, that picture to get back to your radio for however long you think you're going to need to you know connect to the radio. And then the top is done with a linesman's knot. What's nice about this is, and really any wire dipole, is you can just throw a line into a tree, use that as your center connector, and kind of hoist that up. And, you know, that'll work fine. It works great for inverted V. If you want to throw two more lines, you can get that horizontal, and it'll work really well for you. My, cause, So this is my soda bag, my uh, backpack that I take out in the field. It's my backpack that I take uh, when I do overnighters. And what I'm currently taking with me is the wire dipole. It's a linked dipole that's made by Soda Beams. And Soda Beams is a United Kingdom company. You can Google them, Soda Beams, all one word. What's nice about this one is pre-cut from the factory. It's designed to be extremely lightweight and work off of a fiberglass pole or carbon fiber pole. And that will allow you to have uh, three bands, usually 40, 30, and 20 is in my case what I have. And, you know, whatever I want to do, I can just disconnect the different links and you're ready to go. It's really nice because it's, um, it's pretty much perfectly resonant in the middle of the band. They include a one-to-one -one ballon, like I said, extremely lightweight. And the only problem with it is, is it's, it can be a little tricky to set up the first time. So you do have to practice around with it. But again, this is a pretty straightforward design. You can look up plans to make a linked dipole and you can build this very easily. This uses really thin gauge wire. Again, a um, fishing pole, a tenkara rod, or a Japanese fly fishing rod. And you can get up on the air pretty easily with that one. I'd say it'd take you maybe about a day once you source all the parts. The assembly is easy. The trick is tuning it. So make sure you have something like an antenna analyzer or a vector network analyzer. And this is it assembled. There's my, my oldest son sitting there in the picture, if you can see him. Uh, this is a park in Cerritos, and next to it is what I would call my portable digital shack, which is a KX2 with a Raspberry Pi connected to an iPad Pro, and I'm generally able to work all the standard digital modes with that, and I was working at that day with that linked dipole. I was actually able to, from that, from that day on single sideband on the KX2, 10 watt output, I was able to complete a call, single sideband, uh, with the UN, with that UN station. I believe they closed down for a while, but they reopened, and I was able to make a successful contact with them, which was really, really nice. And that was just out of a park. You know, I'm not that far away from the RFI. I could still hear them really well. And they heard me, which was the best part, because QRP can be difficult. All right. So generally, the fishing poles that I mentioned are found on eBay. I recommend if you don't have one, get one, and ideally get two. And I have a couple of, of opinions or, or thoughts that you should uh, follow when you're when you're looking at them. I generally like the carbon fiber ones a little bit more than the fiberglass. They're roughly the same relative price between the two materials, so generally it's not a big deal to step up to carbon fiber. The rods generally have no uh, wire guides or, or fishing line guides. Again, this is Tenkata, which is a different style of fishing that originated in Japan. The difference in the picture, you can see there is a wire guide. I actually put that on there, and that's specifically for that speaker wire doublet, so I can hang it up. 
When you look at these on eBay, I generally recommend that you go with one meter longer than you think you need. The reason for that is you can see in the picture, the little thin pieces that are sticking out, that is the last segment of the fishing rod. And really, two to three segments lower than that, they're not going to be able to support the weight of an antenna. So you're going to want to have that extra length to get your antenna up in the air. So consider if you're thinking about, oh, I only need five meters to get that center connector up in the air, really go for seven. Seven is kind of the sweet spot that I recommend, if not, if not a little bit uh, taller than that. There are, there are a number of companies now that are producing really nice telescopic antenna rods. Gigaparts has some. Sodabeam has some. There's a whole bunch. The difference is, is that they're going to cost a lot more. You're going to end up spending $50 or more for a really nice one. The difference is, is the walls are going to be thicker with the more expensive one. They will likely pack down to a lower, a shorter overall size which is generally facilitated by having more sections and that's you know an order of magnitude a little bit more expensive the ebay ones are generally fine i have broken them though so keep that in mind and yes they will fit in a suitcase a carry-on suitcase which is generally what i take with me i like to bring one of these i'll bring my soda beams and maybe one of those verticals with that's that has the the loading coils in it and I'm generally good to go when I when I take a vacation and I, I genuinely have my Elecraft KX2 on me for that okay so let's go back to those portable verticals and talk about them for a second in a little bit more detail I already mentioned they have usually a telescopic whip or a wire and some form of loading coil with a tap of some kind if it's multi-banded most are multi-banded and that's generally a wire that you use to short it out. And some examples are the MFJ 1899T. It's been around for a really long time. The Elecraft AX1 came out last year. The Comet HFJ 350M came out recently. And, and I'll show you something on that really quickly because I, I think it's kind of interesting. So for me, since I'm most often doing soda, I won't really go uh, any further past 20 or 40 meters. So this is the this is the main body with the loading coils. It also comes with this big loading coil is what gets you down to 80 meters. So if you don't want to carry this around, you don't have to. Um, again, consider the only difference between this antenna on, on 40, 20, and 10 is this big coil to get it down to 80. So you can imagine how that will affect your, your pattern and, and potentially how you're getting out there. So keep that in mind, they are, they are compromised. Uh, with that said, I've been able to successfully make a contact from Prescott, Arizona to Japan, single sideband. And I did it on the last uh, CQDX single sideband contest. I had some time, I was actually meeting up with uh, another YouTube channel and I was uh, sitting in my hotel room. I went down to the breakfast bar, loaded up my plate, and I was listening to the bands, what I could hear in my hotel room, which if you travel a lot and you've ever tried to work HF in a hotel room, it's usually a pretty bad situation. I was able to make the contact from the window in my room uh, out on that little AX1 antenna. Fantastic. I, you know, again, that is an, a, a rare example. It's, it's fun and amazing that that could happen, but, you know, consider that it, it, it doesn't always go that way. I'd say that's rare. Uh, here are a couple examples of vertical antennas that are compromised. The one on the far left is an inflatable antenna that I did a review on called the air antenna. It actually uses what's called a scuba diver safety noodle. Um, scuba divers will inflate these if, you know, if they don't have a boat by them or you know, they need to rest or whatever, and they would hang on these. They figured out how to get 20 meters into that thing, and uh, it works but it's compromised. The one on the right there in the middle is the 1899T attached to my KX2 again. And then on the far right, going from the top to the bottom is the um, Wolf River Coil. I think it's the 1000, the Take It Along, the TIA. The um, MFJ next to the AX1, and you can see the size comparison between the MFJ and the AX1, and the green spool of wire is the radial I use for the MFJ. And then to the left side, which is cut off a little bit, it's a shame I should have I should have done a better example or, or grabbed another picture. 
that is the QRP guys three band vertical antenna that uses a wire vertical and the wire is 14 feet long so you actually are getting 20 meters uh, kind of a full length 20 meter antenna on vertical on the vertical and then it comes with four radials so it's actually a really really nice and very inexpensive antenna if you wanted to get that i've done multiple activations with that antenna and it seems to do pretty well i'd give that the nod over the the 1899 the 1899 and the m uh, the elecraft ax1 all right so end feds and random wires i mentioned this earlier the Antennas generally require a, tra a matching transformer, a 49 to 1 uh, un un or a 9 to 1 un un, which is an unbalanced, unbalanced transformer to help match to your feed line, which is your 50 ohm coax cable. These are great antennas because they are also extremely portable. It's just a long length of wire with a small little matching box that you connect to your radio. I generally prefer the NFED half wave antenna when going portable because it is one half length or wavelength of wire for the lowest frequency that you're operating on. And so that's generally nice because you don't really require a tuner. Uh, they do take some work up front because you will need to trim your radiating line, generally using an analyzer if possible, and that seems to work pretty well. The 9 to 1 un, -un is generally used with what's called random wire length antennas. And that is, those are actual important links. It is a non-resonant frequency for the frequencies that you're going to try and operate in. There are images online, tables online that you can look at that will give you an idea of what those links are so that you can... Uh... <laughs> My son just opened the door. I apologize. Please close the door. Please close the door. Please close the door. <laughs> He's asking me if he can use the radio, so I, I guess that's uh, appropriate. After I'm done with the talk, can you please close? The, can you please close the door? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's what it's like with uh, COVID-19. You you have children everywhere and you can't get away from them. They're underfoot all the time. I should just have him come give the talk. Really, uh, the nine to one on on it will work. Uh, generally, though, you will require a tuner. So if again going back to the Elecraft uh, KX2, that will work with a un, un or if you have a Shegu G90 or X5105, those also have 10 to 1 tuners, and those will work with 9 to 1 un uns as well, or just any radio that has a 9 to 1 un, -un. The issue, again, is that your feed line quickly will behave kind of like a counterpoise when you use these type of antennas. So generally, I recommend getting an extra long coax or as long as you want to pack around and potentially consider a counterpoise a wire that you'll you know lead off the side of the of the antenna the example image here is a chameleon antenna mcom3 portable the reason why i show this one is even though it's not qrp it's definitely packable the reason is is this one comes equipped with its, with its own radial which makes it nice. You just get the radiating element into a tree and you drag out the radial, uh, ra the um, counterpoise or radial, and you're pretty much good to go, which is a really nice setup. All right. All right. So, talking about radials, I have with me here, I built this not too long ago. It's a chalk winder that I took the cordage out of the chalk winder and I put in radial wire or antenna wire and I use this to get those vertical telescoping antennas in to alignment or resonance with the frequency that I'm operating on those verticals that I showed you have a horrible uh, name in ham radio if you look up any of the reviews for them they get horrible horrible ratings and the reason generally is because people don't fit them with an appropriate radial to match the antenna or match what you're trying to work on the antenna. In the picture here, I have a mounting plate which has a knurled screw and I use a little spade connector to attach the radial to the base of that antenna kind of system. And then I just crank out more or less wire when I'm out in the field. I'll use a, a, a mode like an FM mode or something with a constant tone like CW. I'll use my SWR meter to show me where I'm resonant 
on that particular band or how I'm doing on that particular frequency. And then I'll just adjust the wire until I get the SWR down to where I want it to be or where it should be. This takes uh, pretty much all the guesswork out of it. You don't have to spend a lot of time at home, you know, making sure your wire is appropriately cut for whatever you're going to be operating on. You just stretch it in and out, you know, crank it to whatever you need. It makes it really, really easy. And I think this is the last one that I'm going to talk about for packables. The mag loop, um, you know, will barely kind of fit in the packable antenna. However, I have hiked with them. I, I have done a one soda activation with that antenna. Mag loops are cool because they don't have any radials. They don't have any things to kick over. I think it's a great beach antenna because you don't have kids knocking them over or people, even if it falls over, it doesn't really hurt it. Uh, but it, it doesn't have anything to trick, trip people up. Generally, they're great receiving antennas in this configuration with the loop kind of going forward vertical like that. It's horizontally polarized, which will cut down on RFI a lot. It, the problem, though, is that they are high Q. What that means specifically is the SWR curve, if you will, you know, if you've ever seen an antenna analyzer, they kind of little sweep down like an upside down parabola on a mag loop particularly the portable type, the Q is extremely narrow. Your, your resonance space of, of being able to transmit is very narrow. So it makes kind of hopping around the bands more of a chore, more problematic. So generally, they're, they're fun. They have their place, but uh, really it's going to be up to you. You can homebrew mag loops that will do a lot better and, and get a little bit more wide with their bandwidth, but oftentimes the one you find online are kind of narrow. If you are doing a soda activation, this is not that big a deal because once you find a frequency that is not in use and you put your soda spots out, same for parks on the air, um, once you put your spot out, people will come to your frequency and you don't really have to hop around a lot. So they'll work okay in that, in that situation. And they can be incredibly uh, sensitive to power output though. So if you feed it too much power you can arc over the capacitors that are inside that thing and that would be very bad <laughs> so we don't want to do that uh this is i i use this antenna a lot this the picture on the right which is kind of the first picture from the the uh, beginning of the slideshow i'm actually cooking pancakes at a pancake breakfast while operating hf radio and that's the setup for that which uh seemed to work fine so good antenna if people are milling around because there's nothing to trip over. All right, so for VHF, UHF, I generally recommend two antennas that are for portable, actually three antennas. In SoCal, again, SOTA, you can do an activation right off of your HT, five watts, generally no problem. In fact, it's actually really easy to do. It's really easy to do an activation with a VHF, UHF radio in SoCal because you get to the summit, you get on your favorite repeater, and you say, hey, who wants to hop over to 145, uh, dot, or sorry, <laughs> now I totally lost 146.520, 146.520 and make a contact, and boom, you're done. So there you can head home. It's pretty easy. With that said, generally what I take is a Ed Fong uh, roll-up J-pole fantastic antenna just in general not just for portable applications but you know he sells one that goes on your roof it's in a pvc pipe it's a really good upgrade um, if you're looking for a antenna for home but they're fantastic out in the field my my funny antenna is the abri um, vertical 42 inch vertical that sits on the top of your ht they work they work really well surprisingly well for as funny as they look the problem is, is that if you have any kind of wind it'll it'll knock the the antenna over on you while you're trying to do your activation so that can be problematic and then lastly is uh just a yagi like this arrow antenna you can build a tape measure yagi really really easily for two meters or 70 centimeters and that's fun if you know exactly where the person is that you want to talk to or kind of a relative area and you'll definitely be able to um, really work a lot of contacts with that and also the added bonus of having a Yagi like that, that one in particular that has dual band capability, is that you can work satellites, FM satellites with that, which is a great portable activity to do if you have not already, uh, already thought about doing that. In fact, that's what I'm set up for there. That's my Kenwood D72 
connected to an inline audio recorder and then into my earphones so I can hear. All right, so that's packable antennas. My thoughts, my opinions on that. We're going to talk about luggable antennas now. All right, so I want the luxury of home, but I'm in the field. What do I do? What do I go for? What do I want? Generally, luggables are like freestanding antennas, something with its own tripod. Almost all are 100 watts and all the way up to legal limit power in case you're bringing an amp with you. Because why not? You're going to the park, make sure you bring your amp. Uh, they can be complicated. Some of them can require you to really understand what's going on, but that varies a lot. There are many, many, many different um, antennas in this space. So I've kind of picked a few of them that I like that I own or have used extensively to talk about. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go through that in a minute, but the cost of them can vary wildly. Um, you can get started with a luggable really cheap and then you can really drop some serious coin on them. So I don't really have a specific category for these. I consider these kind of bulkier antennas, something that you would have in its own bag potentially. This is kind of the exception. The Wolf River Coil, you can pack in a backpack, but it's a little bit on the heavier side. But it is it will take up to 100 watts of single sideband, and it's generally a really, really nice antenna all around. There's people that run these as their home antenna. They just have this outside their home. Uh, they generally, I guess, are only sitting on one band at a time, and whenever they want to change, they go outside and move that collar up and down to change where that, uh, where that coil is at for whatever band that they're on. They're weather resistant. Like I said, you can leave it outside um, all the time. They're multi-banded, but only through your physical manipulation of the antenna. The good thing about this antenna is it doesn't require a tuner. You would just put your radio into what frequency you want and then adjust this antenna until it is uh, resonant on for that frequency to match your radio. So it's good for a host of situations. The only problem is you, you do have to go lay hands on it uh, every once in a while. And if you've never used one before, they can get a little tricky. So keep that in mind. The first time you use it, you're going to – what I did was I took Sharpie and I kind of marked where the different band spaces are. So 20 is way up at the top, but, you know, to get to 40, it's further down. And then, you know, it, it changes a lot. So make sure you, you mark it if you go down that, that road. Wolf River in general, they go to Hamvention every year. They're, they're really active in the ham community. Um, they're fairly inexpensive, I think, for what they produce, and they have a host of different options. They have a shorter coil version of this, which is even more portable, and they have a center-loaded variety, meaning the, loaded, the loading coils in the center of the antenna, which they say is a better performer, but I haven't tested that one personally. But this good take it along. The 1000 works fine. And again, you could probably build this. In fact, I know of a 3D printer print model that you can print that will do a lot of what this does because really again this is just a coil of wire where that collar is shorting or either lengthening or shortening the coil of wire that's connected to the whip and connected to your feed line that's really all it's doing so you can build this at home it's the same kind of design it's a simple concept it comes with three radials, which is great. This is one of those antennas that you really wouldn't want to just have one radial on one side sticking out. You want kind of more. And if you could add more to that, even better. And uh, what I did is I swapped out the MFJ 18-foot whip. So I'm basically most of the high bands, I believe up to 20 meters, I, I, I can get access to pretty easily. And that seems to work pretty well. So going from really inexpensive to like all the way kind of like most expensive uh, for portable luggable antennas is the Step IR Crank IR. This is a kind of a de-expedition type antenna is kind of how I, I would refer to it. It is a non-COVID-19 field day. This would be a great antenna to use with a group of people potentially, but you could set one up in your backyard too, I guess. It's two meters through 80 meters, full legal limit power. It uses a reel-based system for the radiating element and the radial system. So that's where the crank comes in. It literally has like what looks like actually a fly fishing uh, open bale on it. And you can just crank for whatever band you want to operate on. If you can see it just above that white little plastic dot, I'll see if I can get my mouse over it, this little purple shrink tube, 
That's actually how you denote where the band's at. You just crank until you get to the band you want. You stop. You adjust your radial to match your SWR, get the get the match, and you're good to go. So good good antenna for um, a de expedition or a or a club field day. This might be something a club could buy. It would be owned by the club and would be pulled out for events. On the cheaper side, another luggable, um, and I and I know that this is luggable because I. One of my first soda activations, I actually carried this thing out, and it was a it was a six mile hike, and man, free <laughs> tripod, mast, the center connector, all the metal hanging off of that. That was uh, that was kind of a, a hike in itself. The advantage though is that this is six through forty meters, so I was able to kind of hop around if I wanted to. I've used this in field days before. I've set this up at parks. It generally doesn't draw a lot of attention if you're kind of um, in between some trees. It kind of masks itself well. But if you're at a park, just keep in mind people are going to come up and they're, they're going to want to talk to you. It's really easy to tune to, to match which frequency you're working on. But it can be tedious if you change bands a lot because you actually have to go in there. It has a coil and you also have to adjust those metal elements. And those are telescoping, ro telescoping rods. Uh, I don't have a picture for this, but it's basically the same as same comments I had for the Chameleon Portable, which is the um, the MCOM base. This is the portable variety. The MCOM has a bigger matching box, which takes the same. It's the same pros and cons of an NFED, but this bumps it up to 500 watts on single sideband, which is great if you are just going to use this for 100 watts or less. You can set this up and then basically never, ever have to worry about it again. Um, and if you built a transformer that could handle up to 500 watts, it would be it would be worry-free for a really long time unless you had some kind of like weather inclusion. So these are great, uh, not just Chameleon. They make good quality stuff. But again, you can homebrew this not that difficultly. So MCOM, and uh, like I said before, the N NFED half wave does not require a tuner for the bands that the element is cut to, so that makes it really nice. And you have a variety of options. You can hoist up the box on a tree and let the wire slope down. It's called a sloper. You can have uh, the wire midway through be raised up on a fishing pole like the Tenkara rod. That would be an inverted V. And you can do an inverted L where it comes across the top of a tree line. All right. Uh, the the, only, the I mentioned this because it's a fun antenna. This is the only antenna that got the cops called on me. The uh, the MFJ Octopus antenna, and there are multiple companies that make this type of antenna now. It is a dipole of sorts, but the elements are hard or they're firm elements, and it uses hamsticks. So you get four pairs of hamsticks, whatever pair, band, band pairs you want, and you connect it around this circular connector, and it literally sticks out eight legs like an octopus, and you hoist that up in the air, and then you get the cops called on you. The, the call came in that I, I believe, and actually what's funny about this is someone who's a fan of mine or subscriber of mine contacted me and said, I watched your video, and my police friend was over, and he was actually the the um, the dispatch person that got the call. They sent me the blotter that came in, and the the actual line was, uh, "Man in park playing with what looks like a radio." Um, I'm concerned over what he's doing, <laughs> and so they sent the police out. It was really nice. He was really nice. There was no problem, and just you know, where is it? Uh, I don't think I have it here. It's in my it's in my bag. I have a card. Take your FCC card, your license card. They have a little wallet sized one. Get that laminated. Make a couple of them and throw them in all your bags, your backpack, um, whatever you take out in the field. Throw that in there because I held that up and I said, you know, here's my here's my multi pass. I've got my license. Um, I'm good to go. I'm good to be here. And it was it was fine. So anyway, four pairs of hamsticks. I use 80, 40, 30, and 20. It's kind of just how the sun cycle is right now. Those are the pairs I work with. The downside is that ham sticks, we're back to coils. Uh, they use loading coils for the radiating element. And when you're talking about like 75 meters, the 
tuning on the uh, the antenna is extremely narrow. It brings that cue up again, and so you're basically going to have to tune this one at home for what frequency space you want to operating on, what you want to operate on. So keep that in mind if you're going to go down this road. Now. Um, I mentioned this because I was probably putting way too much power through it, but uh, I did melt a portion of mine uh, because I was doing, this was actually a field, an FT8 sprint or an FT8 um, event, and I thought I'd go to the park and have some fun, and uh, I melted my antenna and the cops got called. But it's a fun antenna. And this is how I cart it around. I use a golf bag. Uh, you got all those ham sticks, and you got that center connector and the mast. I throw it into a golf bag, and that's kind of how I get it around. It's also kind of funny that you can put your radio, your feed line, you can put all that stuff in there, and you're good to go. Uh, Got to mention it because a lot of portable, again, I must repeat, I am mentioning antennas that can be purchased online, but you can do most of this. Homebrew plans are everywhere. There's not just uh, you know blog-type posts that are written on how to homebrew this stuff, but there are plans all over the place on YouTube. You can find examples. So just... Just make sure if you're thinking about going down this road, see how expensive it would be to do it on your own because it's it's not that hard at all. And, you know, the easiest thing you can do is just cut a dipole. Cut a dipole for a band and get out there. So generally with a dipole, I'll just throw this out there. There's no reason you can't build a great antenna at home. If you want to uh, make something a little bit more robust, just increase the gauge of the wire. Make sure you attend to the tuning of it appropriately. Add a one-to-one -one ballon. You can purchase these, but again, they're also easy to make. And it's a great thing to do while we're dealing with COVID-19. So look up the projects and have fun. Um, I'm a quick shout out again to Homebrew, the 49 to 1 Unun, -un, which I really, that should be the picture for it. I think that's um, the appropriate picture. But anyway, that's a fun project to do. You just basically will build a little box and then you can attach a different wire as you need to. If you don't need to run the full length for like 80 meters or 160, you can just take 20 that day if you're going out in the field. And do consider running a counterpoise if you are going to do any kind of NFED um, or a random wire. I know you don't have to, but it's been my experience that I prefer it, particularly if you're going to run digital modes. It can mess with the cat control from your computer to your radio if you have a stray RF. Okay, we're, uh, we're wrapping up here. So important accessories. One is none, two is one. If there's any kind of vital component to your antenna system that is small or tiny, easily lost, whatever, get an extra one and have it in your go bag. And it just lives in that bag, your radio bag, and it, it doesn't get taken out. Examples, coax adapters, PL259s to BNC bayonet connectors. Make sure you got extras of those. And I would go even a step further and say two or three. Those BNC post connectors, the ones that have the red and black, those are super cheap. Buy three of those. An antenna analyzer. I, I hate, I'm holding one up that's like a couple hundred dollars. But you can get like a nano VNA, and, and that'll work fine for you. And it, it's not the best, uh, particularly in the field, but if you didn't have one and you needed one, you definitely want it. Case in point, there is a nano VNA, and there's that BNC terminal post binding connector. Um, I have one of those in like every bag I own, I think, that I don't even necessarily put ham radio in there. I just always have one. Because worst case scenario, you can make an antenna out of that, that BNC post connector. Just get a, a long wire, get a radial, adjust it as needed, or again, if you're using a KX2 or an, a Shagu uh, G90, just let the tuner handle it. <laughs> okay, here's my antennas to avoid uh, section. Lawn chairs, lawn chairs, um, they don't tune up. And they're really difficult to find a specific band to get them resonant on the frequency you want to be. That is, uh, my wife came home that day. That was a fun day. Um, I threw those up on the side of my house, and I hit them with the 7300 tuner, and the 3 to 1 couldn't handle it. So I tried to adjust it around, shortening the center connector. There's not much you can do to a chair, right? It's already a chair. Um, I did find a spot, and I was able to make a contact with it, but I, I do not recommend. The Magic Wonder Staff, if you've ever seen the magicians, you know, they, they open their hand, and all of a sudden they have a full staff. Well, that's like spring steel or something along those lines. You can make an antenna out of it. I did, and it does work, but they, um, they're stretchy. So if you stretch them, you will 
totally screw up the SWR curve on whatever you are operating on. So they can be a little fidgety. They work, but not recommended. Okay, so parting words. Uh, generally, full-length antennas are going to work the best for you in the field. I mentioned the dipole. I mentioned the doublet. There's a reason why so many people carry those out into the field for doing soda because they just work. They're simple, and uh, they get they get great results. I wouldn't put the uh, NFED halfway of that far behind it, personally. The vertical telescopics, though, can be tricky, particularly if you are dipping into links of wire that are a part of that coil system. So just keep that in mind. But magic can happen. You know, like I said, I made a contact to Japan on that AX1, and it was shocking. Um, if you want to make something more portable, that's full-length wire antenna, just scale back the wire gauge. You're going to be running lower power generally anyway, so just scale that back. It'll make the bulk a little bit less. It'll bring the weight down. If you favor portability over a full-length wire, you will have a harder time out there, especially using QRP, but crazy things happen. And always test your antenna at home or in a local park. I highly recommend going to a local park if you can. And the reason is I did a video on, uh, I called it What's Killing Ham Radio. We're killing ham radio with all of our electronics. Our RFI is an absolute nightmare for all of our, uh, all of our antennas. So if you can, go to a local park that is really RFI quiet and get things set up that way, particularly if you're going to set up a dipole. All right, so to wrap it up, the best antenna is the one you have on you. So whatever it is, it doesn't matter if it's a compromised antenna. Get out there, have some fun, and, uh, and try it. Have fun with it. And these are pictures from my uh, campout that I held. That uh, Those are a lot of YouTubers in there. Some of you may recognize, like Ham Radio 2.0. Jason, he's there. Uh, we all, they flew out to meet me, and that was uh, Pacifico. And there's a sunset over... Oh, gosh, where was that? Was it Temecula? It might have been Temecula. I'm not sure because I think it faces that way. Anyway, so that's my talk. Do we have any questions or are we out of time? Do we have time for questions? All right. There you go. I am uh, unmuted now. So, yes, we definitely have time for questions. Okay. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is uh, if everybody will go to the gallery view and people can raise their hands and we'll take uh, turns. I do see that um, Walter and Larry have their hand up, or did. Larry, did you want to say something? No, I was just applauding. Ah, oh. applauding. <laughs> Great. That's wonderful. Yes, Thank you. I would like to first uh, give our uh, a big shout out to uh, Jim in Zero Triple X for bringing Josh, uh, Thanks, Jim. recruiting Josh tonight. Really, thank you, Jim, for that. And that was just an outstanding presentation, Josh. Thank you ever so much. So Thank you. Thanks for giving um, me the opportunity. I love doing this kind of stuff. That's great. Uh, George, did I see a hand up with you? You did. I had a, a question and a comment. Uh, well, let me put the comment first. <laughs> Josh, I had an opportunity to work up in the San Francisco with one of those 1899Ts from inside the house on my MD817. So okay. it was a matter of getting the, uh, you're right, with the, uh, the, the counterpoise, getting that uh, centered correctly. That was really important. The second thing is, and I, I don't know this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's your favorite beer? Oh, uh, I am a stout man myself. I love okay. stouts, dark beers. Um, what's my favorite, though? That's a tough one. Uh, there was a, uh, it's called Higher Math. I think it's made by Dogfish Head. It goes kind of on the darker side. That's, I think, my one of my favorites. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank Samuel Smith. Samuel Smith is an English uh, stout, really outstanding. Samuel Smith. I want to write that down. All right. I think it's brewed in London. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks for that. So I see uh, Michael Hart, K6, uh, KC6, MEH. Please go ahead. Hi, Josh. I um, want to know, are tape measure antennas safe to transmit on? Sure. Like a, like a Yagi? Tape measure Yagi? Yes. yes. I built one for a fox hunt, two mm -hmm. meter, and it's okay to transmit on it. Do you have an offset attenuator connected to the antenna by chance? I do. Yeah. You don't want to transmit into an offset attenuator, but if you disconnect that, you absolutely can transmit um, on a two meter Yagi. Just make sure, obviously, you're checking your SWR to make sure it's safe for your radio. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
Awesome. And uh, next, I see Jim in zero triple X. You had your hand up. Please go ahead. I do. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Uh, I want to say thanks, Josh, for uh, doing the presentation. That was really great. Um, one of the, the question I have is on the MFJ octopus that you melted on 20 meters. What, how many watts and for how long were you operating on it? Uh, it was it was FT8. I was running for probably two hours nonstop, um, and I think I was putting out a hundred watts. <laughs> so I I don't really fault the I don't really fault the antenna on that on that one. <laughs> That's a lot. All right. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for sending me the email to bring me out here. I appreciate it. All right. And I'm not seeing any other hands up on the participants as far as, oh, okay, I see Chris, Chris uh, KM6OUK. Go ahead. Good evening. And thanks, thanks Josh. This is fascinating. Um, one question. Um, I noticed that you're using the BNC connector. You've mentioned BNC connectors numerous times. Do you use the BNC as a common connector for all your antenna? Or like, is that is that the, the one common standard that you use? So that's a really good question. And actually, there should be, you know, when you packable versus luggable, um, the luggable antennas are all going to be PL259 generally. Your packables are more aimed towards QRP radios. And, you know, I, I've just got one right here next to me. Uh, QRP radios generally have BNC connectors. That's been my ah. experience. The Elecraft KX2 BNC connector. The 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 only one that would be outside of that is that uh, Shegu G90. That's a 20 watt output radio, and that has a PL259. So generally BNC. And another good point. Thank you for bringing this up. I generally try to not use adapters when possible. I always carry extras because you never know what's going to happen. But I try to, if I know I'm going to be using an antenna that has a PL259 and I'm connecting it to a QRP radio, I will have a cable that does PL259 to BNC. So I try to cut down on any kind of feed line losses where possible, particularly when I'm running QRP. You want to make sure you get all those, those RF pixies out that antenna as you can. Great. Thank you. All right, so I am not seeing any other hands up on the participants side, and I can only see half of the participants on the screen. Let me uh, go, any other hands up on either side? No, I'm not seeing Dave. any other hands Is up. Is it or Dave any other... oh, and Dave to JNR? And to JNR, yes, please go ahead. Hey, Josh, great presentation. Um, you mentioned briefly analyzers, and I noticed uh, you know, that first image, it looked like a rig expert. And then you mentioned the, um, the nano VNA. And I, I know I'm unfamiliar with the nano VNA. Yes. Um, is there, like, I mean, I know you said it wasn't that expensive of an analyzer. Um, like, what are the features? Is it one that you would recommend? Or what do you recommend usually out in the field or, um, you know? That's another fantastic question. So the important thing to keep in mind with the Nano VNA is it is a very small size. Actually, I'll grab one, but I'll say this before I go grab it. It is a network vector analyzer. So if you're familiar with that test equipment, that, that item that would go on your bench, it has all of that capability. It would be something you would use to test a filter or an antenna, something along those lines. It gives you way more capability than you need in the field. I generally try to use the rig expert when I can because it's dead simple. It's designed to be an antenna analyzer. It doesn't have any of those extra features that the vector network analyzer has. But I'll hold it up, and, and while I'm doing that, um, the the VNA, the the Nano VNA, they run anywhere from fifty dollars to a hundred dollars. Now, the key thing to remember is it's this big. So the attractive part of it is it's 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 about the size of a pack of cards and about a, as thick and it has an internal battery. So it's attractive for all those reasons. The problem is is that it's it's fairly complicated to use correctly. I did a, a video review of one where I walked through kind of how to use it and I think I had to shoot parts of that video five or six times because I was having issues with it. But it, it 
if you got to learn it, you, you, you'd you like it. But it is kind of uh, hard to approach if you're not used to using test equipment like that. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Gil. Anybody else for tonight? Josh has been wonderful to uh, spend time with us, and I know your son wants to come use the radio. So um, unless there's any other questions right now, we'll just say thank you to Josh and uh, let him move on for the evening unless he chooses to stick around. But uh, I'll leave the channels open for a while if anybody wants to socialize and talk. Uh, Joe, did KM6VRG, did you have a question or are you just waving? Looks like you're just waving. All right, excellent. I, I was going to say, if anybody does have a question later, you can find me at uh, hoshnasi at gmail.com. I'm good on QRZ. You can find me that way. And then, of course, there's the YouTube channel. We have the Facebook page. We have a Discord. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Whatever you're on, I'm probably there. So uh, feel free to reach out that way if you have any other questions. Thank you ever so much. Really appreciate it, Josh. Yeah, thank yes. you very much. Everybody have a nice evening. I'm going to go figure out what radios my uh, my kids have been playing with now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I'll see Josh. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Josh.